G'day, I'm Martin Isles, and I'm coming to you a little differently once again in this election season. I'm speaking to another person who's going to be on your ticket if you live in the ACT when it comes to voting day uh, on the 21st of May this year. And it is Senator Zed Seselja, the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Zed, thank you for doing this. Thanks very much for having me on, Martin. Now, Zed, you are somebody who I think would be maybe in the top three to five contenders for most exotic name uh, <laughs> in the parliament. Uh, you're known as Zed, but your, how do you pronounce your actual first name? Well, it depends if it's Croatian or English, but yes. uh, Zdenko or Zdenko in Croatian. Okay, uh, so Zdenko. Z-D-E-N-K-O, Zdenko. So the, Z, the Zdenko. D's not silent? No, it's not. you sort of <laughs> got to stretch out the Z to say it properly, Zdenko. Now, what does it mean? Uh, it means sort of a, a well or a spring. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, a bad. well of wisdom or something like well, this. Well, you could fill in the blanks. Who knows? There'd be all <laughs> okay. sorts of different views on that, Martin. <laughs> Look, I'm going to give you a quick career summary, yep. um, and I've got some notes here. This is the quickest career summary you're ever going to have had. Uh, you were the child of, and I think I can say this, poor migrants? Uh, relatively, relatively, yeah, that, certainly pretty modest income, yeah. Yeah, so your dad took up photography and was the... That's right, single income, six kids. Six um, kids. Yeah. Then you went on and worked at Woolies, then you were a cleaner, then you studied law and arts, then you became a legal assistant at the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. You went through a couple of stages to become senior lawyer at the Department of Transport and Regional Services. You were then a member of the ACT Legislative Assembly, which for viewers who aren't in the ACT, it's the Territory Government uh, down here in Canberra. Uh, and that was in 2004. Had a bunch of shadow portfolios, but I think were most well known for being the opposition leader. And that was 2007 to 2013. Came within an inch an close. inch so close or so so <laughs> so close to taking territory government in yes. 2013 and for in this political environment for a liberal opposition to get to that point is a big deal you know here in the act so you did that didn't get there but then quickly became senator for the act went up to the federal parliament uh, then you had a number of assistant minister portfolios social services multicultural affairs science jobs and innovation treasury and finance finance charities and electoral matters and now you are the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Somewhere in there you found time to have five children, get married to Roz. Uh, it's quite a, a picture of success and achievement. What's your reflection on it? Well, it's, um, it's interesting when you sort of summarise it like that. It's, it's, it's rare that you sort of think, think back to sort of, you know, being a cleaner in um, right. my old school. Yeah. It was, um, McKillop Catholic uh, High School. Um, but look, it's, it's been a really exciting journey, I guess. And, you know, um, I've enjoyed all of the different aspects at various times. I've found struggles and challenges in all of them at, at various times. Um, the family journey has been the most important, but the career journey obviously has been something that I take very seriously and I see as a bit of a vocation uh, going into politics. Right. So very much if I think about it, you know, it was, you know, Roz and I very much making those decisions together, those big life decisions such as, I mean, the big moment really is when you decide to go into politics the first right. time and then... It changes your life. It does, it yeah. does. And then putting your hand up to be leader and those sort of things are, are big, big moments. So, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, mm. I, I guess at some point I'll be able to reflect back on that and, and think about things, you know, hopefully that I've achieved in that time, things where I've fallen short and there's many of those as well and, sure. and, and hopefully reflect on, you know, I guess that I did my best and tried to, tried to make a difference for the city first and, and then for the nation. Mm. And you are now Minister for International Development of the Pacific. Yeah. So you've got a portfolio that affects the whole nation and indeed some overseas nations as well. Yep. Um, now, I think as with a lot of things in politics, people hear that title and go, oh yeah, mm. but inwardly they're kind of blanking out. <laughs> yep. What is the role exactly? So it's the two, the two roles sort of come together. So international development is effectively our aid uh, and so that, that's all around the world. That's not yes. just in the okay. Pacific. Yep. Uh, so that's our four and a half billion dollar or so annual aid spend. And oh, I see, because there was a change not that long ago. There was a big discussion about the fact that aid was going into development work rather than simply more of a donation style aid system. But yeah, it's sort investing of, in... I mean, the language is development assistance. So the okay. technical language is ODA, Overseas Development Assistance. That's, okay. that's how we measure what we do. But then what we do in the Pacific is a, a pretty large chunk of that overall aid spend. So nearly half, oh, yep. it's 1.85 billion this year in the Pacific. But there's a lot more we do in the Pacific as well. And, you know, it's really interesting. Um, the engagement in the Pacific is huge. The aid spend is part of that, the security cooperation, those sort of things. But even within the aid and the, and the contact, I mean, we've got great people-to-people -people links. 
the sport and the faith side of things are huge. Okay. Um, it's a really interesting thing that when I'll meet with Pacific leaders and sometimes on the phone and sometimes in person, obviously more on the phone uh, in the time I've been yeah, uh, sure. in the role, but certainly there's been enough in person. We'll often have a prayer together uh, and I've done wow. that. I've done that with... But they're very religious nations, aren't they? Very uh, much The so. Pacific nations. Very, very much faithful, so. yeah. And they appreciate, um, they appreciate you doing that. Um, for me, obviously, it's, you know, it's a genuine thing. I'm a Christian. It was interesting. I, I met with um, a number of Pacific leaders in Brisbane a couple of weeks ago and we were talking yeah. about a number of these topical issues such as the Solomon Islands and things. And I met with the uh, Tongan Prime Minister for the first time. I okay. met the Tongan Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. And I, I led off with a prayer when we met and we had a really good chat and, and talked about all sorts of issues. But at the end of it, he, uh, we were, you know, we were hanging, hanging around and having a bit of a lighthearted chat. And he said, you know, he said it was nice that, that, that it was someone else who led the prayer rather than us. You know, it's always, <laughs> okay. it's always the Pacific Islanders who, who yeah, do that. Sure, so yeah. I think he appreciated that we were able yeah. to, you know, come together in prayer. And, and it's, you know, I think it's bonding uh, to do that. Absolutely. It's a good, good fit for the role. I mean, you volunteered the fact there that uh, you're a, a man of faith, you're a Christian. Uh, and you mentioned before that your role in politics, you see it as a vocation. Do you have any comment on, you know, obviously I talk to a lot of Christians about politics and there is a prevailing resistance. I don't know why really, mm. but there is a prevailing resistance to the idea that people of faith should have involvement in the political space and yeah. take it very seriously. You use the word vocation, which mm. is, you know, taking it very seriously. What's your feedback on that? Uh, you know, is it, is, it, is it right and good for people of faith to do it? Without a doubt. I mean, my, my view, and I came to a very strong judgment when I first went in in 2004, uh, was... If, if good people, and then that's not, of course, just people of faith, there are plenty of good people who are not people of faith, but if good people are not in the political process, as messy as that is, and it's messy, yep. it's tough, uh, but if the good people aren't there and people who have genuine good intentions and good values, including uh, people of the Christian faith, uh, very importantly, then, well, there'll be people maybe who have different values and, and, and different things driving them. And I think most people who go into politics have very good intentions, but, you know, worldview is important. And certainly mm. I think that um, Christians should absolutely be in the space. I think that I'm a, I'm a big believer that whilst I, I'm very happy we live in a pluralist democracy, uh, there's people of different faiths, there's people of no faith, that's, that's one of the great freedoms we have to, to worship or to not. Right. Um, and, and I respect that and I respect our democracy. And But it... it I would argue and make the argument that certainly Christian values and what we learn, particularly from the Gospels, uh, adds, I think, a lot to public life. And yeah. I, think, I think the idea of loving your neighbour as yourself, I think the idea that we're created in the image of God uh, brings a certain perspective that I think is important. And um, yeah, we don't ram that down everyone, anyone's throat, but it certainly informs you know, who we are and informs our worldview. And I would say to Christians, mm -hmm. yeah, it's messy, but you know what? Church politics is messy. Yeah. Life is messy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing's yeah. easy. Nothing That's worth right. doing is easy. Yeah, and, sure. and I would say that Christians being there is a, is, is a positive for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, uh, even you're a minister, which is just borrowed straight out of Romans 13, which mm. calls people in uh, you know, politics, leaders, ministers of God. So yeah, it's a, it's you a service. You're, yeah, you're, absolutely. Serving, you're serving the people and the government. Mm. Yeah. You've said that, uh, and I read this in a speech, that a, a big motivation for you to go into politics was your children. Mm. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, it's sort of ironic because politics does take you away from your children a little right. bit, uh, and, and obviously it's it's tough. Um, I have the great blessing of, of you know being based in Canberra, and compared to many of my federal colleagues, you know, not having to travel quite as much is is a great blessing. But it's still a, a great challenge, of course. And, and in my role as mm. uh, minister for the Pacific, of course, it's different, but, isn't it? I mean, uh, there's members up in northern WA and, this yeah, kind and, of stuff and regional got, Tasmania, and, got and got anywhere. To commute in, yeah, yeah, it's it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's a, yeah. it adds an extra burden yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's there's no doubt that um, you know having children does um, tend to make you sort of just look at the world in a slightly different way to what right. you did before, I think. And I did it very young. Um, like, Ros and I had Michael just before we finished uni, actually. Um, wow, So okay. it was actually the last day of lectures. He came. He was meant to come after exams, but he came six weeks early. Okay. And uh, so, you know, for me, fundamentally, I was looking at the world in a slightly different way, and that was I have this precious life that I'm responsible for now, what kind of a world do I want them growing up in? And so that sort of got me thinking about the world in a slightly different way. I was probably always politically um, motivated. I was always politically aware, 
but it sort of drew me to join the party and, and to get involved in a, in a different mm. way. Uh, we see that so much. Um, uh, I would say that the number one consumers of the materials we put out, particularly on worldview and about what, the, the state of the nation and the affairs of you know what's going on, the number one consumers of that tend to be young parents, yeah. uh, especially young mothers. Yeah. Uh, they're just consuming it, devouring it, because something's changed mm. you know, in the way they view the world. I think they're you know, grateful for people who can go into the space uh, and you know, stick up for what is good and what is right. Yeah. Uh, well, you want, I mean, you want your kids to grow up in a good place and, they're, they're, and then by extension, uh, you want everyone's kids to grow up in a good place, right? And that's, and that's the draw of politics and public life. Yeah. You're, um, uh, you are characterised as someone uh, of mostly conservative values. Yeah. Uh, and that's other people's words. Uh, sure. Also, uh, as we've said, a man of faith. Um, Canberra has probably got a reputation uh, as a very, very secular progressive jurisdiction. Um, and those of us who live here sort of know that. Uh, and I think that's led to some of your detractors uh, predicting your political demise on multiple occasions. Mm. Uh, but you won in 2013. You won again 2016, 2019. Uh, and for those following along, uh, territory senators go to every election, not every second, like state senators. So you've survived all of those. We're coming down on 2022. Uh, what's the secret? How come you're surviving? Why are the predictions of your imminent demise simply wide of the mark? Well, look, I mean, it is it is challenging. There's no doubt. It's, a, it's quite marginal. Uh, and so we fight very, very hard uh, to hold this seat. And I think it's important that we do. Um, sure. uh, look, I think, I mean, I do try and I'd, I'd say I'd make a couple of points. One, you're right um, in terms of, I guess, the characterisation of the city and, and certainly in its overall voting patterns and the like. Um, but that doesn't represent absolutely everyone in the city. There are still a substantial uh, number of people in Canberra who, I guess, would have you know more traditional values, depending on how you describe them. But certainly, you know, people of faith or, or otherwise, just traditional values, conservative, centre right, those sort of things. So it may not be a majority uh, in the city, but it's a substantial minority. And of course. Everyone needs a voice. They certainly need a voice, and sometimes they get shut down and, and mm. get told that their view is not valid, and because they're not the majority in the city, those sort of things. But I think also even reaching beyond, you know, that particular part of the constituency, I think you know I work hard for the city. I mean, there's a lot of things that I would just seek to deliver. You know, infrastructure and housing and those sort of things, whether I was in local government or in in federal government. And so I guess you you do your best to try and deliver. You fight for things. There are some people who may not agree with everything that I stand for, but may respect the fact that I stand for things. So sure. you know, you get a bit of a mixed bag. But it's it's not easy. But you've got to absolutely fight for every vote. Yeah, sure. Um, you. Uh you're in a slightly different position to some in the parliament. Um, uh, perhaps I'll put it this way. Uh, amongst supporters, I, I often see people uh, that are following after very outspoken politicians. Uh, and there are larger than life politicians uh, in the parliament uh, who have large social media accounts, say a lot of good things, speak their mind, uh, cross the floor on occasion, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I know that um, there's a prevailing uh, mood out there that says, well, I wish all the politicians were like that politician. Mm. Uh, and that's not to criticise them at all. They play mm. a very valuable service. But uh, I guess what you and I know and what those who follow politics closely know is that they are backbenchers uh, and that gives them a certain liberty. Uh, or crossbenchers uh, yep. from a minor party. Yep. Uh, and the reason I raise it is that you're in a slightly different position. You're a minister in the government. Uh, and so you don't have the freedom to be as outspoken from the outside of the tent, so to speak, uh, and to uh, you know, break rank. Now, but the question for me is, you know, does that mean that your influence is any less valuable in the political process. To me, it's just a different kind. Yeah, look, I think that's a fair summation. I mean, it's 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 less visible sometimes. I yep. mean, I certainly had a period as a backbencher and I was outspoken on some issues and from time to time I yep. did differ with my party on issues and sometimes that gets you in a bit of trouble. Sure. And, and also some of I've those- I've read some of the speeches. <laughs> and, some of that, and some of those people who you, you speak of are you know, close friends of mine and I sometimes disagree when they speak out. Sometimes, you know, I might, I might agree, but, um, but it is a different influence and you know being part of a government means that you know there's a bit of collective decision making uh, mm -hmm. and you know if you're not an independent and I, I think the parliament if it was full of independents I, I think would be quite chaotic I really think it would I know people can okay, look at yep. parliament and say you know it's it's tough now and it can be a bit chaotic but at least when you have party platforms 
for good or ill, you, you get a, a bit of an understanding of what our party stands for, what the Labor Party stands for, what other yeah, parties sure. stand for. Yep. Independence, really, and if you had more and more of them, I think they could go anyway on any given issue. There'd be a lot less certainty. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's times when you may be not 100% happy with a decision that's taken by the government. Obviously, you know, and I haven't reached this point ever, but if you were, if it were such of such a level um, that you felt that uh, you couldn't serve in that, then, you know, you'd have to consider your conscience and, and then that would mean of resigning. Yep. Uh, and of course, you know, we all have to consider that. Uh, yes. And so, you know, we have to follow our consciences, but we also, it is good to be part of a team that can deliver things mm. as a government. But it doesn't well. stop you having robust debate within the team. Yeah. You know, it's not in front of the TV cameras, it's not out on social media, but you do have robust debate with your colleagues and uh, an active role in shaping those decisions. Yeah, very much so. And, and a lot of those debates happen. And, you know, you can imagine when you're in Parliament, there's a lot of different groups of people who get together, uh, sometimes over a, a drink or a meal, sometimes, you know, in between parliamentary sittings, and we're constantly debating these things. And there is very rarely a sort of universal view on any given issue. Uh, yeah. There are very few issues where we all agree, but certainly you, you have robust debate. And, and I guess as you have that opportunity to have in slightly more senior roles, you know, you can get the ear of the Prime Minister, or you can get the ear of the relevant senior minister, or you can influence your backbench colleagues as mm -hmm. well as you're having discussions. Yeah, right. So it's a diversity of influence there, which is important, I yeah. think. Yeah. Let me get into some of the uh, issues. I've got a quote uh, here from your maiden speech, uh, and this is on the subject of freedoms. You said these, you said, among those values, that is values that you, you uphold, are the protection of the great freedoms, freedom of speech, enterprise and religion. For me and my family, this issue is personal. One of the reasons my family left Croatia was because freedom of speech and religion in particular were curtailed under a harsh communist regime. My uncle, is it Stepan? Stepan my uncle yep. Stepan spent several years in a Yugoslav prison for daring to challenge the communist regime and assert his rights to speak freely and pr freely practice his religion. So um, obviously there's a story there which has deep implications mm. for your politics, deep yeah. impl implications for your beliefs. So I want to ask you questions on those great freedoms, as you say. But first of all, uh, I'm kind of interested, um, what did the regime have against Uncle Stepan? Well, a couple of things. And uh, he has written a book. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was 89. He lived a great life. Um, and he has written a book, but it's in Croatian. I haven't yet read it. Okay. I, I need it to be translated. Okay. My Croatian's... It's okay, but I couldn't read it that level. Okay. Um, uh, but... I've, you know, I've gleaned a bit from him and from Dad and, and from others in the family. He was a seminarian, so he was studying to be a priest at the right. time uh, in the 1950s. It was post-World uh, War II. There was a communist regime of Tito. Um, and there was part of it revolved around a very particular cleric who was in the firing line of the Yugoslavian regime, Cardinal Stepinac, uh, who was a very famous cleric. He was under house arrest, I think, at the time, uh, till he died, I think, in 1960. So he was sort of persecuted. They made all sorts of claims about him, which I think have largely been debunked uh, in a number of studies since. Um, but he was controversial. My, my uncle Stepan, I understood, refused to condemn him when, you know, the, the various, um, you know, communist agitators would come and, and get him to condemn. And so they put him in jail. And, you know, there's probably more to the story. Um, I suspect as a Seseldry, probably, you know, couldn't keep his mouth shut. He probably, <laughs> yeah, you know, okay, wanted yeah. to speak. And, you know, I'm sure, sure not every seminarian got put in jail at the time, but sure. maybe those who were particularly forceful in their it's views. It's always the way, isn't it? It's the people who speak up. Indeed, that get indeed. Trouble, and yeah. that's true in it's, all through history, isn't yeah. it? Um, but he was there for about six years. And one of the stories my dad tells me, and it's, it's quite inspiring, is dad was quite little, uh, quite young when they visited him in prison uh, in the 1950s. And he remembers um, the guards talking to my grandmother um, and saying to her, look, your son could leave with you now. He could go home with you right now, but he, he really needs to sort of renounce the faith and he needs to sort of back down on what wow. he's saying. And he refused, um, which, you know, showed great courage, I think, and mm. puts into some perspective, I guess, some of the debates we have around you know, the, the freedom to speak up, the courage to speak up. I don't underestimate that speaking against the tide or against the majority or against what's, the, you know, what the media are particularly supportive of at a particular time doesn't take courage. But you sort of compare it to that sort of courage and I think yeah. it does put it in a little, little bit of perspective for us yeah. and also make us reflect on what great freedoms we have that we're not thrown in prison. Well, that's right. Yeah. 
you know, we might end up with a little bit of harassment or something like this, but it's we, just so light. We might so be cancelled. Well, right. we might be cancelled, exactly, <laughs> we'll be canceled. but it's just so light compared yeah. to what you see. I mean, I, before doing this job, I went to Europe and uh, it was the Protestant Reformation anniversary at the time. And uh, to see the stories of the courage that people took in those days, mm. uh, like, you know, you mentioned your uncle Stepan, he, he wouldn't renounce, you know, you think of someone like Luther who says, I cannot recant. Uh, and whatever side of the Tiber you're, sure, you're on, sure. uh, it's, it's, it's great courage, you know. Yeah, uh, it and is. again, it sort of made me feel like, well, you know, what cowards are we in yeah. this day and age that we won't even be cancelled <laughs> for what we believe? Uh, look, and people yeah. shouldn't be cancelled, of course. Of course not, uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Yeah. That shouldn't be cancelled. But nonetheless, you know, people have people have taken great uh, cost in the past. Yeah, um, and, that, and 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 by you know, it does remind us too that even small acts of courage now, yes. um, maybe not quite as significant as you know being thrown in prison and, and standing right. up to that. But even small acts of courage matter because they 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 give other people, I think, license to be courageous as well. Mm, courage is contagious. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you've got a close association then through what we just discussed, uh, through your history, through, through your family, with the dangers of authoritarianism, the yeah. dangers of loss of those freedoms, those great freedoms. What do you make then of what is the modern argument that I just encounter all the time, and you'll know it straight away, which is that, well, you know, these freedoms are harmful. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, for example, if people are free to speak or free to believe and act on their faith, you know, it's all going to be unpredictable. Uh, and you're going to get rat bags in there that say horrible, hurtful things or believe horrible, hurtful things, and you're going to do harm. Uh, what's your argument in reply to that objection? I mean, it comes up constantly. Mm. Well, I think the type of harm that's often talked about there in that criticism is a very subjective harm, I suppose. So obviously, um, you know, we have rules and laws rightly about physical harm or encouraging physical harm or encouraging violence. And there's right. very good reasons we, we do that. Um, but I think parts of the sort of, parts of the modern left, I suppose, in this contest on free speech have step to another place where they will define all sorts of even offence as being harm. And yeah. that's where you get into very dangerous territory, I think, because it's very subjective um, and it's very much about, you know, someone's uh, personal experience or offence and response to something you might have to say or I might have to say. Now, when I defend freedom of speech and I don't, I don't, um, I, like I, I tend to e express myself, I think, pretty respectfully. I actually think that's a good principle. I, I don't think we of should, course, yeah. uh, but where you draw the line at law is a different question, right? I think civilized discussion is what we should all aim for. I, I don't think we just throw rocks at people just for the sake of it. But, but civil, civilized and of course robust discussion is important as well. But we shouldn't therefore be uh, you know, denying people the ability to say controversial things or things that are unpopular because it might offend uh, some people. I think we have to be big enough to sort of allow that discussion to take place, have the discussion, um, and then also call it out. You know, when it's a bad idea, if it's a really hurtful, dumb thing, if it's expressed in a bad way, I'm happy to call it out. Mm. But it's just a question of not banning it and, and certainly this this tendency to cancel uh, people because of one or two or three things they've said that might be inappropriate or, or mm. wrong. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's the way to go. And I think a lot of Australians are probably starting to react to, to that push. Mm. Well, you and I, I guess, believe in a greater truth, don't we? So we, we believe that there's something worth arguing over. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I'm offended, well, it's not really the point, is it? There's a greater truth yeah. that, that I might be drawn closer to mm. or that I might have to re reassess. Uh, I wonder whether a lot of it is identity politics, where the, it's not a greater truth, that the truth sort of is in me and, uh, you know, it's all about my identity and defending myself. And you can understand why when people have debates about those big things, like like religion, I mean, debates about religion mm. are very personal, right? Uh, of you know, if you're a Catholic Protestant sometimes or, or sure. you know, different faiths or people of faith and no faith. Um, it's good that we have those debates. It's good we have those discussions. Of course, people are very passionate about it, rightly so, because mm. it's fundamental to who we are, is what we believe about life on earth, whether there's an afterlife, what that looks like, all of those things. You can never get away from that, uh, regardless of what your views are. That, that mm. is, that those are the big questions of life. And so it's right that we um, discuss them. It's right that we debate them. It's not right that it's robust, but uh, hopefully not. As I always, I try and do it respectfully. But I don't think we should, you know, ban people because they do it slightly less respectfully or in a way that I don't like. Sure. On the religious discrimination bill, then this is the freedoms issue um, that recently failed. Now it didn't come, didn't get voted on in the Senate, so you didn't have a direct vote on it. Mm. 
Uh, but again, these harm arguments were raised in relation to it um, spuriously because the only statements of belief it protected was non-vilifying statements mm. of belief. Um, but what's your reflection on that? How important was that bill in your view? Yeah. Uh, and should it come back? It was important. It is important. Uh, and yes, it should come back. Um, and, you know, I mean, the Prime Minister's had a bit to say about that uh, in recent times. I, I, look, I, I've been a big supporter of religious freedom publicly and, and internally in some of those discussions and debates. I think it was disappointing how it transpired. Um, obviously, it was largely um, because of um, the vote of um, our opposition, but of course there were a few of our number who also sided with them and that was disappointing. Um, the reason it's important is because freedom of religion is a fundamental and bedrock right, which I think has been downgraded a little bit versus other rights. And, right. we've, and we've seen that, I mm. think, in some of the discussions about anti-discrimination law and the like, where um, you know there's always going to be a clash of rights. That's that's true. And and, and international law recognises that and it, it sort of has ways of dealing with that. Mm. The way our state and federal laws interact at the moment, I don't think it gets the balance quite right. Probably doesn't interact. It just says freedom of religion gets second place. It, right? Unfortunately, yeah. in some cases, and we saw that in Tasmania, didn't we, uh, with Bishop Porteous yeah, sure. and, and there's yeah. been been other examples so you know we that's why it's important because people should be free to speak they should be free to uh, you know when it comes to uh, faith-based schools and the like they should be free to choose those um, those are very important freedoms that need to be protected and mm. the second we downgrade those seriously um, we are we are putting other freedoms at risk for sure mm. yeah I agree it's upgrading something that's been downgraded in the past what about there, there is a criticism out there which I think can be addressed but for the good things that the bill did uh, there are some people who are concerned that it was going to appoint, say, a religious freedom commissioner within the Human Rights Commission. What's the way around that? Because people sort of go, well, that's a real concern. Mm. Uh, is there a solution there? Look, I mean, I know there was a lot of dis discussion and debate about that internally and externally. Mm. I, I think, I think the, the strongest argument for it is, I mean, you do, when it comes to other human rights, such as the right not to be discriminated against in certain ways, we of course do have human rights commissioners who play a certain role. So it made sense if you were going down the path of basing sure. the law in a similar way to have that discrimination commissioner for, for Maybe religious Maybe it depends purposes. who the discrimination commissioner is. Indeed, it always does. <laughs> yeah. uh, but in the end, the law needs to be robust enough too so that it shouldn't just rely on whether the, the particular discrimination commissioner is, you know, the, the person you or I would choose or otherwise. Yeah, sure. And for the record, I don't think that that was a deal breaker at all. The mm. good things the bill did were sort of outweighed it. Um, but of course, uh, the balance might have been flipped when it got to the Senate because a number of amendments were added that would have uh, taken away some of the protections that Christian schools sort of rely on at the moment yeah. to, uh, to uphold their ethos. Um, not in the ways that the media claim no. <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's just such a, a, a dodgy hit job on the schools, but in, in positive ways and good yeah. ways. Uh, you've said a few things about Christian schools, and I'd like to unpack this. I've got two quotes here. Uh, one's from 2018. Uh, you said, one of the great things in Australia is that parents have the opportunity to choose, based on their religious beliefs in many cases, an institution which adheres to their beliefs, be they my majority or minority beliefs. So the choice of a Christian school is what you're referring to there. Then you mentioned an issue of parents' rights. This is from 2017 speech. You said, I want to make one other point in relation to safe schools, and I think everyone remembers that program, uh, and parental choice. When you ask virtually any parent faced with some of the material around things like safe schools curriculum, whether a parent should know about that and have the opportunity to withdraw their child from, the, from those kinds of classes, you get an overwhelming response in the affirmative. As Senator Fawcett has pointed out, South Australian Senator, uh, in accordance with their rights under the International Covenant on the Religious and Moral Instruction of their Children, parents should be able to withdraw their children from those classes. This is something worth fighting for. So you raise that uh, issue. Uh, do you think that in that context, you think parental rights are under attack? Well, there's certainly, there's certainly in some of the debates, yes, they are, and they can be, and I think they are well worth protecting. And the, the debate about um, uh, choice in schools, faith-based schools and the like is, is probably at the heart of that, but it's not the only part of that. The reason it's important um, is because when I send my kids to the school that we've chosen, um, I mean, we are the educators of our children. 
as parents. We right. are the, the primary educators of our children. It is our responsibility. Not the state. <laughs> and and we, are de we are delegating hmm. that to others. We are effectively, when we send them to the local state school or to the local Catholic or Christian school or Islamic school, you are making a decision to hand over a bit of authority, to trust others uh, with your, your child's education. Now, you're not... Um, you're not sort of saying that that is absolute. <laughs> you, are, you are taking it on trust to some degree, but of course those parental rights are still paramount. And, and so that's reflected in international law. It's reflected in part in Australian law, but it, that could be stronger. And certainly when we talk about whether or not faith-based schools should be free to teach uh, their religion and their beliefs, that's, that's, a, that's an extension of parental rights because, you know, there's a lot of choice here, right? There is a lot of choice. You can, you can choose, even amongst Christian schools, we have great choices. You know, you, if you are, you know, a, a Bible-believing, fairly conservative Christian, there's a number of schools you can choose. And then even in, in Christian schools, there are, there are schools that are Christian schools, but perhaps would, would teach things fairly differently uh, mm, and, sure. and would take a fairly yeah. different approach. And so parents, parents can look at that spectrum mm. and say, well, what is right for my child and what, what, what most... Uh, reflects my beliefs. And so that, I think, is such a fundamental thing. And the debate about schools is very much an extension of the, the debate about parental rights. Yeah. Um, and so what about this argument then that people say, well, if a faith-based school wants to teach uh, a particular view, a faith-based view, then they shouldn't get state funding. Um, that's something that's come in uh, recently, as if you know they're, they're outliers and they shouldn't be allowed to exist. That doesn't seem to be your view. No, it's not. And, and I'm a big believer in, in, in government funding for um, non-government schools, for faith-based schools, for other independent schools. Some, some are not faith-based, but that, that, that's that extension of parental choice because what I would say is, um, you know, taxpayers, uh, whether they send their kids to a government school or a non-government school, they're paying their taxes. Uh, and then some are choosing for various reasons to make an additional contribution on, on, on top of their taxes for their child's education. Now, that's, yeah, that's, true. that's a choice they're making. Not everyone yeah. can do that, either financially or, or wants to do that. But if you do do it for whatever reason, including as a result of your faith, I think the government should come in behind you. And that's a, that's a debate that really you know, goes back to the 1950s and 60s. Uh, when we first mm. had these debates around Catholic system. It was actually down the road from here in Goulburn where we had the Goulburn strike, which started this debate and the Menzies government first started funding um, these Catholic schools and then other, other schools. In, in the UK, uh, I think they have versions of religious schools that are completely government funded, uh, where you can, yeah, okay. actually, we can actually have a no fee uh, Catholic or Anglican school, I understand. Yes. So that's a very different model. Ours is a bit of a hybrid model, but certainly the government, I think, should support that choice. And there's a diversity thing here as well, isn't there? People People who say that don't realise that, well, taxpayers are people who send their kids to non-government schools, yeah. Christian schools, Catholic schools, government schools, mm. you know, <laughs> they're all taxpayers, yeah. so a taxpayer's funding, you know, should cover them all. Indeed. Um, and if you look at the demographics of most of your low and mid-fee um, Christian Catholic schools, Islamic schools, they will, you will see that they are, they, this is not a wealthy set generally, yeah, this, is, this is ordinary families in the suburbs. Yes you know, paying a few thousand dollars, sometimes with great um, trouble to do that. I remember my, yes. my family putting six of us through Catholic schools. I know they found that pretty hard, yes. uh, but they, they were make the sacrifice. very committed uh, yeah. to seeing us get that type of education. Yeah. Uh, I want to just dwell on this for a second longer, just to point out something. You said at the start that the parents are the educator of the child. I like the way you put it. You're basically entrusting some of that to somebody else yep. for a time. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not unlimited. Yes. Uh, it's a certain amount of trust and there needs to be uh, information passing between the two and it needs to be within boundaries. Uh, is there, do you think, a genuine uh, shift away from that view, uh, particularly among some sort of, let's say, more over the left side of, of, of the spectrum, to actually resent the fact that parents ought to be the primary educator of the child? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and at the far left, certainly, yeah. um, you would say they would see the state is the educator of the child. Now, that's mm. not, I, I'm not going to assign that to all of my political opponents by course, any stretch, yeah. but certainly parts of the far left that, and, and around the world, you do see that, you do see this debate. And if you look at authoritarian regimes, um, you know, where, where my family came from, Absolutely, it was the state. The parents had no rights uh, in those circumstances, and mm. you know you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to sort of 
go to school and be speaking out of turn about you know what your parents might be saying about the school, all of those sort of things. But certainly I think there is part of the left, and I think it is the far left that would see that. I, I once had a debate, and I forget the name of the individual. It was, she was an Israeli politician. I was on Q&A, uh, and we had this oh, debate. Okay. And we you had and this debate. I have debate. that in common uh, <laughs> on in, Q&A. Indeed, I've been a few times. Um, <laughs> oh, man. But uh, she was effectively <laughs> making the argument, not only on education, but she was basically saying that families are the problem for children, and mm. the state really should take on this role. So there is that view that exists. Yeah, gee. It's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's move on to life. Um, I just want to make a couple of observations here uh, for people. Um, and that is that you've stood fairly firm on, on life issues. Uh, I've got some information about your record here. Uh, you've spoken against euthanasia in the, in the Senate. Uh, you voted against congratulating New South Wales on legislating abortion to birth. Uh, you voted yes to a motion supporting counselling for women who were considering abortions. Um, you voted yes to a motion stating that gender selection abortions shouldn't be Medicare funded. Um, you, I know, are um, a financial contributor to a pregnancy support centre. Why is that something that's sort of close to your heart that you've decided to invest in? I think it goes to our humanity, doesn't it? Um, you know, so, yeah, Karina House is the organisation, a right. uh, great organisation here in Canberra, and what that is is a really practical response from people who believe in the sanctity of life saying, um, you know, we, we will make, we will, we'll make it as, as, as easy a choice or as accessible a choice, I probably should say, uh, for women who are doing it tough, having tough pregnancies. And so there is that genuine choice, which sometimes I think is, is denied to people. But, you know, it goes to the fundamentals around our humanity. You know, I mean, I, as a Christian, I do believe we're created in the image of God. Uh, that means something. Uh, that means right. that every life is precious. And so we need to, we need to take account of that. On a different track, um, COVID. <laughs> uh, this is something that really is exercising a lot of people for good reasons. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't laugh for that. Uh, yeah. I just laugh because it's, uh, it's vexed. Um, but what I wanted to ask you was, and I appreciate this probably hasn't affected the ACT in the, as severely as it has affected other states. I think here in Canberra, we've been a little bit, uh, a little bit more circumspect about some of the rules and the restrictions and that kind of thing. But do you think that there has been uh, any overreach uh, tending into an authoritarian kind of impulse at times on some of this COVID stuff? I'm thinking particularly like vaccine passports, vaccine mandates, um, and you know, Victorian style lockdown, that kind of stuff. Yeah. What's your view on that? Uh, yeah, look, I think there has been overreach. Right. Um, I, think, I think clearly some of the, the way some of those state borders were administered, uh, mm. particularly beyond the early stages, I think, and, and the way the lack of compassion that was shown in, in some really tough circumstances. Yeah. I remember a, a Canberra uh, lady going up to Queensland. Going up to Queensland. Yeah. That was just awful, awful. And couldn't even see her father Could, pass that's away. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there, there should have been compassion shown. And likewise, with some of these mandates, I mean, I was in Brisbane a little while ago and I was a little confronted having to show that I'd been vaccinated to go into a pub. I, I haven't experienced mm. that in Canberra. I'm glad we haven't experienced mm. that in Canberra. It's a whole different um, mood, isn't it? And it's, a, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And I think the, the, the decision was taken taken and I agree with it and I don't agree with everything that this government has done but the decision was and the judgment was made that people would largely get vaccinated without that type of coercion and that was that proved to be true and I think it's, yes. it's, it's proved true in other parts of the world parts of Australia as well that most people will choose the vaccine some will remain hesitant and won't take up that opportunity but so the arguments that did exist early which I may or may not have agreed with, and certainly I think on some of the, the real mandatory stuff, and particularly, I mean, we're seeing it in WA, I think still with, enough, with much of the workforce. So yeah, I do have concerns about that type of approach. I think, I think we are better um, offering the vaccine as we have, making it widely available. People can protect themselves and their families. Most people absolutely are choosing that. I've certainly done that, but you know, I don't think we want to, in a, particularly in an ongoing way, be ostracising people uh, because uh, of vaccine hesitancy. You end up with a almost a divided society, don't you? Yeah, uh, yeah, and, indeed. You and may as disagree as, with someone, but there's no way to deal with it. it. As I say, and here I don't agree with everything this ACT government's done, but I think not going down that path for pubs and clubs and, and even most uh, workplaces, I think, has, has been the right call, and so I support that. One thing where I didn't agree with them was some of the lockdowns. I think some of the way that was applied, I think, was 
unjust and unfair, particularly to a lot of small businesses. Okay. And we saw, I think, at an extreme level in Victoria with you yeah. know, the extent of those lockdowns and the length of those lockdowns. I, I don't think there was a justification for yeah, that. Longest lockdown in the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why was the government, uh, the federal government, a little bit reluctant? Uh, and I think this is right. So Victoria obviously went as far as they did. WA went as far as they did. Some would argue the whole nation went too far. But let's just take the outliers mm. as obvious examples. Um, uh, why was the government a bit reluctant to call that out? Well, I think there were times where we did. Um, okay. And, you know, I think, I certainly think in Victoria, uh, we saw that. I, I remember speaking about that. I, I remember calling out Queensland uh, when they were not allowing people from the ACT uh, to travel. Oh, okay, so uh, you did. Point. I did. Okay, absolutely. that's worth noting. Uh, I said that that was <laughs> yeah. um, because they, they lumped, they, they said the ACT was, was a risk. And I said, well, the ACT is not a greater risk than anywhere well, else. In right. fact, it was less of a there risk. There no cases. Um, yeah. And so I made that argument I, I certainly argued around Victoria and, and other colleagues did as well so I know Josh Frydenberg and others did so look you could argue the toss about whether that went far enough and I know I know there's been a lot of debate about that but certainly I think we spoke up at various times. Is it fair to say that it would have been a, a, a really big call and probably very difficult for the federal government to overrule uh, the state government decisions on well, some of this? Well I think constitutionally it would have been near enough to impossible. Yeah. Okay yeah fair enough. Um, on one issue that's local, I imagine if people are watching to this point, they're probably going to be Canberrans. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> who are going to have you on their ballot. <laughs> Hello to uh, those who are not from Canberra as well. Well, that's right. They can follow <laughs> along <laughs> just here for the good times. Um, there's an issue here locally which you've been outspoken on. Um, I moved to Canberra in 2014 and I remember thinking, wow, the property market here is pretty competitive. Mm. <laughs> uh, that couldn't be less true today no, and there's no. not been long 2014 2022 no. it's insane yeah. right now insane yeah um and uh even more so i think than other parts of the country yeah um what's the solution well you should have bought i think would uh, I, back in 2014 <laughs> two years ago i nearly did and yeah. it just was the worst decision i ever made um, but <laughs> look it's a serious issue for people well, trying to buy now. Head, but anyway uh, no but yeah, indeed but it, it is a serious issue and uh, look the solution is is multifaceted but clearly land supply is a big part of that so we've got this crazy situation here and there's a little bit of engineering social engineering going on there where the ACT government are sort of forcing people into apartments whether they want them or not now Okay. If people want to live in an apartment, great. And there's, I think there's a great place for them. I'm all for apartments. It's actually living. an affordability thing now. Indeed. They're, I yeah. think they're, they're given yeah. very little choice no at the choice, moment yeah. uh, because land is so scarce. Hmm. So, you know, they, they release 100 blocks and 7,000 people put their name down for those blocks. So that shows you the mismatch. Wow. So we've actually announced some policies to release some Commonwealth wow. land. Um, you know, that's okay. very important in the north of the, the city, uh, old CSIRO land. Um, I've is, pushed, that, is that likely to put significant supply into the system? Well, we're talking at least 2,000 blocks, which is actually um, more than the ACT has been delivering in the last few years, I understand, for standalone housing. Why is that? Why uh, well, is the ACT government so reluctant? Well, there, the there's land. various arguments. One would be that they they own a lot of the land. In territory, uniquely, they own a lot of this land. It's territory land because of the uniqueness of our national capital and leasehold system. Okay. So um, they do keep the prices up, uh, and that's good for their bottom line. Okay. It's yeah. not great for those buying. And even former Labor Chief Minister John Stanhope has actually been very critical of them for that approach. Okay. And, um, you know, in the end, it does force a lot of people over the border. It forces them further out, or it forces them into housing that's just not suitable uh, and long-term rentals when people want to buy and mm. I think the great Australian dream of a family home in the suburbs you know that, I think that's worth fighting for um, mm. you know I experienced it growing up I've experienced it with my kids I've been mm. very blessed to do that um, I wouldn't want to see my kids. It's, it's a pro-family thing isn't it? Uh, I, I, so. I wonder whether there's some ideological stuff going on a bit as well where people ought to live in apartments because mm. it's greener or something like this whether it is or not I don't know but I look at my siblings with kids and they have land and they have and I realize it's it's actually a pro-family thing. It really matters. Yeah. I mean, try raising, uh, you know, three kids in an apartment. I mean, mm. look, some people will choose that, but very few families would actually choose that mm. if they've got genuine choices, if they've got genuine opportunity for something different. Okay. This one's uh, open to you in yep. the sense that uh, you're in the parliament now. Let's say that, that Zed could have one thing raised on the agenda. Mm. Uh, something brought forward, a policy reform, a change, anything at all mm. with no none of the usual limitations that stop these things happening. 
what what's an area for you? Maybe an underappreciated area. Yeah, well, one that's underappreciated, um, and I've had a long-term passion for, is is adoption and permanency. Okay. Uh, and you know, in Australia, we used to have um, a situation where adoption occurred on a reasonably regular basis. Now, there were some bad practices that happened many years ago and partly the reaction to that has been to really make it near enough to impossible to adopt uh, okay. kids and what that means so that's a bureaucratic thing now is it not just abortions and things like that no this is about this is about um because what, what we end up with is kids in in out of home care long term yeah so okay. in foster care uh, yes. and often uncertain foster care often multiple foster care Cycling placements through, we're yeah. talking six eight ten placements is not uncommon dreadful must and, have an awful impact on the kids yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we I, when I was part of an inquiry, we looked at it. There were at the time, and it hasn't changed much. I think it's gotten worse since. It was about um, it was about fifty thousand kids in out of home care in Australia, and about thirty thousand of those had been in in out of home care for more than two years, and about twenty thousand for more than five years. So when you're getting to those circumstances where they're in long term out of home care, we need to find a permanent home for them. And New South Wales has actually embarked on a bit of a reform. I did a little bit of work with the states and territories when I had this portfolio for a short period of time, okay. but it's a lot more work to be done um, because there are, there, are, there are couples crying out who can't have kids and would love to look after children and to adopt, uh, but the various laws and, and bureaucratic processes make that Am very, I right difficult. that in some states it's down to kind of like single digits? of yep. children being adopted, like five in yeah, a year? Yeah, basically. You've seen, I, I, I recall some states where it was one or two in some years. Um, in New South Wales, we see it in the hundreds, and that is by far the most. Wow. Now, okay. that's, that's, still, a big that's still a lot less. But if we compare it to the UK and, and the US, even on a population basis, um, on a per capita basis, they do multiple times, multiple okay. times what we do. And uh, they do make they do give that opportunity to... to and and to what is the key reform that would enable that? The key is that you start early with permanency planning when a child... So you, you have to go a sort of parallel route, and this is what they do in New South Wales, where when a child is taken into care, yes, there is a desire to reunite them with their biological parents if that's possible. If, you know, if there's short-term reasons why parents can't look after them, of course, I don't want to see... I don't want to see that, that bond broken if it doesn't have to be, but you do the permanency planning and, and that way if, if, if a conclusion is drawn that the parents simply are not capable of at any time being able to look after those kids, you have to make a judgement. You can't okay. let it stretch out for years. And in New South Wales, it's sort of in, in that sort of 12 to 18 month time frame, and then decisions are made for permanency. Okay. Just bite the bullet and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Zed, for people who do live in Canberra, uh, why would they vote for you and not an independent? The reason I raise that is because independents and minor parties are more popular than they've ever been right now. Yeah, yeah. And there are contexts in which I'm fine with that, just personally. Yeah. Uh, but we're in the ACT, it's a bit of a different beast, a bit mm. of a different Senate ticket. <laughs> Why would they vote for you and not go for some of those minors? Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, I, I think I would point to the record, which I could go into detail on, but I won't now. But in We've heard some of it today. <laughs> indeed. From you, yeah. But in terms of, um, most of most of the alternatives in those minor parties are, are very much of the green left, I would say. So that would be one very strong reason. And even the one or two who aren't, I would say um, a vote for them in a, in a system where you've got two senators, uh, where the Labor Senate seat is basically locked up. You have a situation where you're either going to have a Liberal senator or you, you're going to have someone from the Green Left. They, they are the really right. the only That's the three. real choice, right? Uh, indeed. It's, it's and, Labor and Green or Labor and Liberal. Indeed. And unfortunately, yeah. I guess, voting for a, maybe a, you know, a, real, a conservative-ish minor party or independent really just makes it more likely that a Green or a Green Left independent comes through and gets mm. the seat. Yeah, I think that's fair enough in the ACT context. <laughs> uh, you told me not to call you this, but I actually want to because it sounds great. Senator the Honourable Zed Seselja, <laughs> thanks so much for doing this. Thanks very much for having me on, Martin. Cheers.